I said I'd touch upon Germany. You know, this is I will do this briefly because in a way I think, I mean, one of the one of the finest historians of the genocide, and I have in Adrian. I think this is, this is I, I would you know, respectfully disagree with him on this point that Germany is, has a direct responsibility in the Armenian genocide in the sense of supporting it, even coming up with the idea for it. I think what we can say about Germany in the genocide period is it's absolutely never going to intervene meaningfully on behalf of the Armenians. It's prepared to let Armenians die as a result of you know, keeping the war alliance together. That doesn't mean it supports the idea, but it's, it's not going to oppose it. I think that's where, that's where it fits much more typically into the pattern established already by the other powers, by Britain and Russia. Um, when Germany really, really appears on the scene in the 1890s in the Ottoman Empire, it makes a kind of tacit pact <coughs> with, with, the, with the late Ottoman elite during the massacres of the 1890s. Um, during the massacres of the 1890s, you know, German missionaries do lend some assistance to, to, to Armenians in the eastern provinces and, and elsewhere. But there's a very, a very important distinction made, I think, in the German official mind between this sort of humanitarian assistance on one hand and political intervention on the other. You're allowed to intervene humanitarianly in the sense of aid, but you're not you're allowed to intervene politically because that will put you in the ranks of Britain and Russia. And we've already seen that Britain and Russia by this time have kind of blotted their copybooks with the late Ottoman states. So if Germany is looking for economic advantages in the Ottoman Empire, has an awful lot to gain from disavowing any political interest in the Armenian question at all. And that's what's going on with Germany. It's that precisely that dynamic I think, that, that takes it into the set, into the First World War. Even as the genocide is going on, you, know, you do see some German missionaries helping Armenian refugees. You do see you know, some consuls pressing the um, German ambassador to make a protest to to Berlin, in turn to make a protest to the CEP leadership. But you know, it's this continuation of this of this important distinction between humanitarian aid on one hand and diplomatic pressure or uh, diplomatic intervention on another. The last thing that the, that the Germans are going to do is, 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 is lose their favorable status in the eyes of the Ottoman elite by pressing the Armenian issue. And that, I think, would explain really what's, what's going on with the Germans during the, during the First World War. And so you know, I'd say you know, we need to, we need to Create, create a nuance there between kind of passive acceptance and active support for the genocide. Now, in closing, just a few words about the United States of America, simply because it's, you know, its historical responsibility in this whole question is much less than all of these other powers. It's, it's not a significant player in the region while the genocide is happening. Significant, by the way, that it never declares war on the Ottoman Empire, despite the, the talk in America of this being, you know, the war itself being, you know, a moral crusade of sorts. But America's historical responsibility in the area is slight up to this point. It has no responsibility really in the agitation of relations which lead to genocide. What it does do, however, is in the aftermath of the First World War, it does something like what Germany does and comes in and seeks advantage, particularly commercial advantage, in the Ottoman Empire and Turkey in the aftermath of massacre, as Germany had done in the 1890s. You know, I think it also makes the same sort of tacit agreement with itself and with the, and with, and with the new Turkish Republican elite that it itself, you know, we've still got some missionaries doing some good work there. There's a huge concern for the missionary infrastructure in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. We know that a lot of American missionaries consuls do good work during the First World War itself. But just as America is not prepared to you know, consider really declaring war on the Ottoman Empire during the First World War, in the aftermath, with the disappearance of the large Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire, with the fact that this is now a, you know, a vigorously secularizing you know, Turkish nationalist regime is in power, there's no, you know, they're, they're, I, think, I think Americans see no advantage at all being made in pressing the issues of in you know, the territorial settlement, commemoration of the massacres. This is you know, precisely the sorts of dynamic that leads to the quashing of the Metro Goldwyn Mayer project for filming the 40 Days of Musa Dag in the 1930s. You know, State Department pressures it because there's nothing to be gained from America in this in this area anymore. This notion that you know, this spurious notion that you can entirely disassociate humanitarian concerns from political ones as if those two things 
uh, exist separately in the political in the political sphere. So what we ultimately see, um, particularly in the, in the period around the Second World War, as the British Empire mercifully <coughs> comes to its conclusion and, and is replaced as a hegemon in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Near East, and everywhere else by the United States. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, you have these patterns all having been set into play in the interwar period, you know, the huge um, solicitousness that Britain develops the Turkish nationalists, the Americans, the Americans also share, they think this is a regional ally with which they can do business, someone who speaks their you know, language of modernization, secularization, you know, in stark contrast to kind of the religious hordes elsewhere. This is, you know, a, a profoundly important strategic decision is made and only reinforced in the aftermath of the Second World War by the expansion of the Soviet Empire into Eastern Europe. Turkey, of course, along with Greece, is one of the countries who, you know, whose, whose future is central to the enunciation of the Truman Doctrine in 1947. Along with um, Iran and Afghanistan, Turkey is held to be the central, you know, one of the three central or core countries within the so-called northern tier of states, of sort of hopefully pro-American states, well, they didn't do that well in Iran and Afghanistan, but they, you know, hopefully American states that will act as a buffer against um, southward expansion for the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Second World War. You know, precisely the same dynamic that one might see with the British and their concern for maintaining a Central Asian buffer zone against um, Imperial Russia in the 19th century. And this is the dynamic which I think is established early in the century, is fortified mid-century, and I think continues into the present day. Despite you know, the downfall of the Soviet Union, we now have other regional enemies against which um, the secular, secularist um, you know, nationalist Republic of Turkey is a useful counterpoint and a model of, of, of you know, how we would like to order the world in that region. And of course the Armenian question, as ever, falls between the floorboards. I expect Professor Blossom will entertain some questions. You didn't mention the uh, independent republic at all. My father was consul. Most of those people, who, those who did escape, often were at home. Generals, I remember one of the generals said, we went there to die, but we were shocked we were able to defeat them. They had a complete independent republic for two years, established universities, established court system, and totally ignored. You didn't mention anything about it. I don't know why. Sure, sure. Yeah. And just purely the interest of time, really. I, yeah, I think yeah. It's, a, it's a really important point you raise. And it sounds like you could talk rather more authoritatively about it than I could. Um, I mean, it, 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 that's, it's, it's a period of clearly of, of, of hope at, at one level uh, and you know, desperation at another. But I, I think I tend to agree with, um, with I think Ron Sumi who writes on this, that you know, what, what's going on in that period there is, is a kind of lacuna before normal great power relations are established. You know, while we Russian Empire is mutating into the um, the Bolshevik Empire. You know, it temporarily retrenches, retreats, does it? Is, you know, is not expressive of itself. The Ottoman Empire is metamorphosing into the into the new Turkey at the same time. This is a period of relative weakness for both of those huge regional players. And in that time, in that time, there is space for other smaller polities to to grow and exist, but. You know, I think in terms of the big picture that I was painting, you could almost say that it, states like the, the Republic of Armenia are almost inevitably doomed as soon as the big powers either side of them start to reassert themselves. And of course in that period, the real problem comes with the fact that Turkey and Bolshevik Russia effectively make an agreement to bring the Republic of Armenia to an end. So you know, it's, it, again, once again, just falls into that kind of the interstices of a much bigger power system. <laughs>